So I believe that Jesus lived in a way that embodied blackness and embodied queerness. He loved regardless of the the rules, the status quo that the society had created around love. His love knew no boundaries. And that to me is queerness. Queerness decides to love regardless. And so a black queer Jesus is the kind of Jesus I can follow. Lockdown 2020. Like most other people, I was feeling the weight and anxiety of, of being in isolation. I had just changed career paths towards working as my dream uh, as a filmmaker, and then the whole world just stopped. While I was watching COVID spread across the entire globe, I got a text from my cousin back in New York City, and she let me know that my grandmother had died. I didn't have the best relationship with her, but I felt this enormous sense of uh, guilt and loss. My family couldn't schedule uh, a timely funeral or burial because the funeral homes were all backed up from COVID. So I found myself doing something that I hadn't really done since I was a kid. I got down on my knees and I started praying. And I felt like a complete hypocrite with the most amazing timing in the world i was approached by p flag about directing a documentary and i decided to use this opportunity to start exploring my feelings about religion and the black church and possibly seeing if there was any change if there was any room for um, a queer afro-latino man to come back to the church maybe and have some fellowship. Um, so I grew up in Jamaica, Queens, uh, which is in New York City, even though people like to pretend that Manhattan is the only part of New York City. It's just not true. <laughs> My single mom was having a lot of uh, drug and alcohol problems and uh, we moved around to shelters and things like that. One of my earliest, earliest memories is literally uh, being in a dresser drawer because we didn't have a crib. And then I have another memory of being outside our building and just playing unattended. And I was playing with these little vials in the street and they had different color caps. And then I realized later that they were crack vials. So I have um, some memories of living with my mother, but my aunt had a dream that if I stayed with my mother that I was going to die. And so she told my mother about this dream and Dreams run really deep in my family, so my aunt became my guardian. Well, at the point where I started having these romantic sexual feelings, I had actually gone to a different church. Um, my godfather was involved in the initial church tabernacle, and we were going like Monday, Wednesday, every other Friday, Sunday. Like, I was always in church. <laughs> like, even when I didn't want to go, I had to go, because my godfather lived in the same building as me, so... There was no hiding. When your godfather's the preacher and he's on the pulpit and it's just everything feels more personal. I remember growing up in a Baptist church on the west side of Detroit that sexuality just wasn't a thing. I grew up in a congregation that just did not mention that sexuality was part of the human experience. It was this very kind of bizarre, we were, we were disembodied in a way, right? Even though I grew up in a church where people felt free to dance uh, and shout and sing at the top of their voices, they didn't feel comfortable talking about those same bodies as it relates to sex and sexuality. I always had mixed feelings. I knew that one day I wanted to be saved um, or, you know, living for Jesus. Uh, I come from a black family, a Southern black family that's traditionally Christian. Going to church was not just uh, an expectation, but in most cases it was, it was mandatory. And so for me, it was like the idea of ever coming out or being out or publicly stating that I was gay um, 
was just something that 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 was unreasonable. Uh, my father was very instrumental in fighting racism in North Carolina before we moved to Washington, D.C. And I was there uh, until I went to college. And at that time, we were dealing with the decline of the civil rights movement and the rise of the black power movement. And some of that all influenced me so that when I decided or when I was called to become a preacher, I was determined that we would deal with all of these kinds of issues as a part of the church's ministry. While I was in seminary, I was also doing therapy in a community mental health center, which allowed me to meet and do counseling with all kinds of people. I really found myself growing and meeting people where, where they were while I was also in seminary. The church as a child, you know, my sisters and I, we would go periodically on a particular Sunday or a uh, Wednesday night for Bible study. Once I was able to identify and um, begin the process going forward, I was greatly afraid of uh, the consequences. The backlash that I got from my mom and my sister who was attending church at this time um, uh, really made me feel like a worm that wanted to crawl back into a hole and hope the, the dirt would fall in behind me and cover me up and isolate me from the verbal abuse that I was experiencing at this time. I had already come out to my mother uh, and I was really taken aback because once you tell your mother, you have definitely arrived, right? Uh, I mean, who else did I have to tell? God knew, my mother knew. And then I realized this thing is sort of, you know, ongoing. I mean, I wasn't finished. I didn't have any messaging <laughs> from my church about sex, except that one, the body was a problem. The body was a hindrance to your faithfulness. The body was carnal and fleshly and therefore sinful. Um, regardless of what you were doing with your body, just your body was a problem. The Air Force became a way of escape. I was turning away from everything that was happening in my life that didn't feel good and positive to now a new life, a new path. If I began to feel like a fraud, I began to feel like um, this is not going to end well. Like, I am, you know, an honor student in college. On the one hand, I was like getting higher and higher and higher in, 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 in respectability and, and this sense of, of, of pending doom was growing as I, you know, was maybe away from the Air Force. Um, in a city that I had never been in before. I had never been to Chicago before going there to go to college. Covenant has always been a, a trailblazing church. It was like that for my father when he became the pastor of what was then an all-white church. He was pretty progressive for his day and time. Uh, not only did he deal with the issue of racism, but he opened the doors uh, to women in ministry in a mighty way. And in fact, that's uh, my father actually... Um, licensed my wife to become a minister before I had even become one. When we first uh, determined that we were going to do uh, holy union ceremonies, what happened was well, there were two persons in our church who were seminarians. One was a gay man and one uh, uh, was a lesbian. And they came to me because they wanted to be endorsed uh, as licensed ministers. I told them that um, to be a minister, it didn't really matter uh, whether they were gay or straight, but it did matter about what their life was like. The lesbian couple went into counseling uh, with an AME uh, female minister who was in the closet, and I counseled uh, the gay couple. And so after about a year in counseling, Interestingly enough, both of them determined that they wanted to um, to have holy union ceremonies. So uh, we did tell them that we had to 
take it to the church because this had never, uh, never been done before. Because I already knew what was coming down the pipe and the the language and the the abuse that I was going to experience. I was dealing with panic attacks. I was literally a nervous person because I felt like I was being a hypocrite. I felt like I was um, speaking lies and it started in the home. And because so many of our parents were so close to the past of the church, it, it began to spring up in the church, which really made uh, individuals like me at the time very uncomfortable. So there wasn't really anybody I could talk to at the time. I honestly thought I was going to hell. And so that gave me a lot of anxiety. Um, my godfather used to say, uh, Jesus will love you forever and he'll love you right on into hell. And so if I had that image in my head that, you know, God loved me, but he's going to love me right into a lake of fire to burn forever. The church is always like, well, you're made in God's image and you're highly favored amongst all his creations. And it's like, well, why would you saddle me with this? Like, it, it just seems like such a setup. Like, it seems so unfair. It seems cruel, actually. And so for my own sanity, and my own well-being and mental health, I left the church. I gave up on it uh, when I was around 16. Uh, my mother passed away um, from pneumonia, which I later found out she actually had HIV and uh, everyone else knew she was sick. And they went to visit her in the hospital and I had no idea. And then I come home from school one day and they just told me that your mother, your mother died. So um, that was kind of a hammer. And I think I had this naive notion that God was going to take care of all the problems and I wouldn't have to suffer as long as I went to church, as long as I prayed, you know, those other people would suffer and, and not me. And, you know, that is not true. And it was not true and it still is not true. Um, but I think at that time I had gained enough independence to kind of declare that I was done going to church. One of the key moments for me in terms of my faith journey was when my father died. He died suddenly. I talked to him on a Saturday, Sunday he was gone. And I was very close to my father. I'm a daddy's girl. And this took my breath away. So I was angry with God and I was also angry with the church because we didn't have sufficient theology to help us carry the burden of pain and suffering and loss. None of the answers seemed sufficient to me. For me, I thought marriage was a solution. And that's, you know, when I began dating who is now my ex-wife and getting married because I felt like this is what God is calling me to do and be. What does it mean to be gay? And what does it mean to have gay sex? And I, you know, would but would would kind of like split off maybe my sexual life and what i was attracted to from who i was as a person you know it was like just because i'm having sex with men doesn't mean i'm gay this was an internal dialogue never would utter those things out loud because of the shame and fear and what the cost of that would be to my reputation and, and, and literally to my to my to my home life and and my family life and just all kinds of situations. Um, and it really wasn't until um, because of that behavior that I, that I keep referencing, uh, you know, um, that I became HIV positive, that that really like changed everything. That was the thing that really um, honestly saved my life. You know, in my early years, I remember my sisters and I were sent to a particular church, um, never accompanied by our parents, but it never really connected, it never um, meshed with me, it never um, resonated within my spirit in terms of this is where I belong. Never understood why I didn't fit in with the other guys and I did all of the 
macho boy things, but I still didn't fit in. I didn't belong. And so I couldn't put all these pieces together because we didn't have language for me uh, what a trans person or a gender uh, non-binary individual was or queer was. We were called freaks. We were called faggots. Uh, and so for pretty much 25 years, uh, I really wrestled with that. So I had to begin to, you know, reconcile this other piece of me that even though I was assigned female at birth, that really wasn't who I was. So I continued to evolve. I had to come to the understanding that for me, this was an evolving process, that I was actually male. So now what do I do with this body that presented different than my mind did? The, the thing that I had, if I had nothing else, was my God and my family. And I had gotten to a place where even that had rejected me. And when you have nothing else, that place of internalized rejection uh, leaves you just at a place of loss and, and failure. There was a strain within the family that I couldn't talk to. And because I already knew their feelings and view about the, tr the, the lesbian and gay community, uh, that was a subject that I didn't even have with them whenever I would go and visit uh, or talk to them about it. But as I began to transition, my hair got a little longer, my face took on a more softer tone because I was taking the illegal hormones at this time, um, they would start to question. And eventually I came out um, while I was pastoring my first church, which was really really the highlight of this anxiety period. I thought I had reached the end of the journey by coming out when I initially came out as same gender loving. But when my mother actually finds out that I'm transgender, it was so hurtful to her. All you can think about is that you want acceptance. Nobody ever tells you this piece that you have to consider about how hurt the people that you love will be. I never knew that I was gonna have to deal with my mother's tears and it broke my heart so. Yeah, my cousin was the last person that I wanted to tell. Um, and I told her and then she was like, oh, I already knew. And I was like, <laughs> all these years. <laughs> um, but my aunt, I, I wanted to tell her really bad, but I had a sort of moment with her that let me know that it wouldn't go, probably go well if I told her. So I, I never told her and she passed away and I always felt guilty about not telling her and maybe giving her the chance to, to prove me wrong. Then we had a young lady when I, early in my pastorate who was suffering with HIV and AIDS, trying to model how we should treat each other. I, I, I baptized her and some people were very, um, concerned about that because they thought that the HIV and AIDS virus could be passed through trans, uh, baptizing someone in the water. But that, of course, did not happen. But what I was trying to do is model what it means to show that we really love and appreciate all of God's people. Did we get some pushback along the way? Yes. Were there people that left because they couldn't get with that? Yes. Did we get ostracized by clergy in a community? Yes, as a matter of fact, you, we used to get a lot of uh, preaching um, engagements and they just stopped. And on the other side of that anger, I found God. I found uh, a transformed faith because I finally could hear God say that what is guaranteed is my presence and my love. And so now I'm like, my doubts are holy. My questions are sanctified. Um, that the point of being faithful is not to be certain, but to be, to be willing to be open 
to however life unfolds with the confidence that God will be with you. I've always just been really, really grateful that that, that worse things didn't happen. Um, as it relates to, you know, being HIV positive, a huge grace was that when, when I got tested and, and um, disclosed to my wife that I was HIV positive, she was tested uh, and, and was negative. It became like, oh my God, I'm so glad that we don't have children. And I'm so glad that, again, I didn't infect her with HIV. Hitting rock bottom that way caused me to really throw away all my ideas of what I thought was right or wrong or good or bad and, and just be open to, to a new relationship with, with reality. And so, um, and that's sort of what's happened over the last 10 years. And part of that new reality was like really, really being willing to say, oh wait, I'm queer and I can probably be do ministry, like the two are not mutually exclusive. I was actually 50 before I started hormone therapy. So it was at 50 that my life began. I spent about 10 years just out in the wilderness and I had to find my own way of understanding God. I had to find my way back. As I began to build relationship with the creator and not the God of religion, I began to fix the broken pieces and I began to find out who I was, who God was, and to redirect the love that I originally had for, for God and for the church. And the church didn't teach me that. I had to discover that on my own. The changes were starting to become more and more noticeable. And I had made mention it to my chairman of my deacon board. And my chairman of the deacon board said, Pastor, I don't understand what you're talking about, but I think you need to call a church meeting. You need to share with the congregation. I spent eight hours explaining to everyone who had a question about what I was doing. When it was all said and done, the words that came back to me from members of the senior community of the congregation said, Pastor, we don't know what in the heck you're doing, but we love what you have done for this congregation. I think the main question that I had going into the interviews was, has the church evolved or changed since I was a kid? That, that was really the big sort of driving factor of it, was like, if I chose to go back to a church now, um, would it have space for me? The answer is probably so multifaceted. There's an element of survival, sort of slavery survival. There's an element of homophobia and element of patriarchy, element of toxic masculinity. And I think the idea of what gay or queer is was probably just warped by years and years of who knows what, you know. So we just got off a Zoom call with Reverend Naomi uh, Washington Lee Part. And like, holy shit. <laughs> Sorry, please don't be mad, Reverend, that I curse. It's a brand new day, you know, and she's really, she really gave me a lot of comfort that a lot of the thoughts that I was thinking, I'm not crazy. There are other people out there with the same thoughts. She's, you know, had a lot of a similar journey. And so it was really nice to speak with her and I can't wait to get like more in depth and do the actual full interview because there's so much I want to talk about with her. I felt like I could talk to her for hours. I am a queer preacher, teacher, dreamer who wants to see the world become a place where all can flourish. I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. And so there was also this parallel process of being condition to understand intimacy and sex in a very perverted and painful way. And I had to see that it was possible to thrive as a black queer Christian person. And seminary was the place where all of that happened for me. I met queer black Christians who were training for ministry. This just sort of blew my mind. 
that it was possible to be a Christian who had sex and enjoyed sex and claimed a sexuality that was not heterosexual. Um, and so I say to people all the time that seminary is where I got closer to God and I got more queer every day. Together, we came with that perspective that we were gonna reach across lines of division, no matter what they were, to help people come together, while at the same time, we were not going to be ashamed of our particularity in terms of our African heritage, nor would we want to deny anyone else of also claiming their heritage as well. Even though we got a lot of criticism uh, from even some of the more progressive uh, Black churches um, in our area, there are more uh, pastors and ministers and churches that are teaching and preaching about sexuality and uh, inclusivity and all of that, even if they have not taken a, an official stance and become open and affirming or welcoming and affirming, they very much embraced uh, the ministry that we had going forward. Activism as a, as a thing changed for everyone uh, in, you know, 20, 2013, 2014. 2014 specifically with Ferguson and Mike Brown. Unitarian Universalism has changed in many, in, in, in wonderful ways, ways that, um, that are just so powerful that I couldn't imagine working at a better place uh, during this time. Unitarian Universalism as a mainline denomination, as a, you know, historically white uh, denomination has taken important steps to dismantle white supremacy culture uh, in its congregations and, and systems and, and communities. And it's just, and in my role, I get to be a part of that uh, and, in, and, and in many ways lead that work. You know, I did some small activism work in Huntsville, Alabama, um, because the church, New Life Christian Fellowship that I created was focused on women and children who were struggling. And uh, much of my congregation made up of women and children at the time um, that caused me to want to become more of a voice, not from just the pulpit, but in the community in, in ways that would help to bridge the divide, make a difference in the lives of these, these young women who were really just looking for a helping hand that would propel them forward. When then it dawned on me, of the four gospels in the New Testament uh, of the Bible, um, Jesus' ministry was a mobile ministry. And I began to realize Essentials for Life Ministries needed to become a more mobile ministry. And I needed to figure out what, the, what the, was that going to look like. So it's just been great to see um, you know, and Unitarian Universalism is very liberal, very progressive. One of the first denominations to ordain women, one of the first denominations to ordain queer and trans folk. And that's what I get to do at the UUA as we welcome in queer people and trans people and people of color. In terms of our daughter uh, who came out uh, as a lesbian, you know, we had never questioned or asked about her sexual orientation and she had never um, said anything. We were surprised uh, that that was what she wanted to share with us. I was almost like a pillar of salt. I felt frozen. And, um, and the reason was because um, in my ministry, I had counseled with so, uh, so many gay and lesbian persons who had such horrific experiences of discrimination in their lives that I was afraid for her. When I expressed that concern, she said, you know, I don't feel comfortable if I'm not authentic. And so that just, that just did it for me. So I said, okay. As soon as she told us that, I got up and walked over to her and gave her a big fat hug. And I told her that we loved her and that we supported her, she could depend on depend on us. We had no idea that she was going to uh, come out as as lesbian, but it, it felt good to know that that didn't have to happen for us to do what we believe 
was right. So we are delighted, we are proud, and we don't care how anybody else feels about it. We know that she is a daughter of whom we are extremely proud. Speaking with the reverends gave me more of an expansive view of religion and spirituality. And so you can be religious, you can be spiritual, you can be queer, you can be black, you can be gay, you can be trans and carve out a space for yourself. The reverends gave me fellowship that I hadn't had since I was a kid. I can talk to them outside of this project. I can call them like I felt I just felt almost part of some kind of community again, some kind of fellowship. And I, I was really missing that, and I, I really, I'm really appreciative of that. I think it's beautiful. The scripture says that where two or more are gathered, this creator of ours is automatically on post, front and center. So I can have church in the building across the street from me where there's actually a church. Or I can have church right here in my living room. Why? because all it takes is an individual. It's not really about the edifice or the building, it's about the people. The answer is about inclusion. It's not about passing judgment because if we are going to say that this is about God, this is about the church, well, then this is about love. This is about us staying connected. This is about us making room for each other, not condemning each other. In light of that, it is a challenge because one has to accept the realities of, of you know, the conservatism that is so much existent in, in the church in general, uh, in the black church in general as, as well. I think that ultimately, the barriers to inclusion have to do with people feeling like they'd be losing something. So I want to get that on the table. What are you afraid of losing? Is it, is it power? Is it kind of social capital, social currency among the religious ecosystem that you are, are living in? Is it, is it social standing? This is a perfect opportunity for you to take full advantage of every opportunity put before you to help change the perception and the beliefs that so many have that are completely off base. Many of our young siblings are on a roller coaster anyway because they're still trying to um, uh, establish their own identity. And sometimes that's a bit challenging and can be a little confusing, but that's all of the growing up process. They need you there to be supportive. So I'm asking you to be as understanding, loving, and supportive as you possibly can be. Jesus never met anyone at a point of judgment. He always just met them right where they were. And the only people that he kind of met at a point of judgment were the religious authorities. For most of us, particularly black people, we feel like we owe it, <laughs> like, 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 like we owe the church something, or we owe religion something, or even God something, then really you are just enough. Who you are is enough, what you're angry about is enough, um, where you live, what you feel like doing on Sunday is enough, who you feel like explaining to is enough. God calls us to do some, some challenging things, and it gives us joy, not that we think we're better than anybody else or that we think, you know, everybody's got to do it our way. But what we did believe was that what God was telling us to do, that uh, we had no choice but to do it and to find joy in the midst of doing it. We've led your choirs. We've been in the kitchen. We've been on the hospitality committee. We've been driving people back and forth to church. We've taught your children proper etiquette in church. We've helped with the babies. We've always been there. Now that you're forced to recognize and respect us, don't get nervous. Don't become afraid. Just have church.